I know that there's a lot of mature electricians listening out there, but I also know that there's a lot of young guns too. And with the electrical industry moving so fast, like with solar panels, with EV chargers, smart lighting and things like that, there's bound to be a few new techniques discovered. But some electricians, they do like the way they're taught at college. I was taught that way at college, so that's the way I'm going to do it. And then some of the younger lads say, no, no, I respect the guy that taught me, so that's the way I'm going to do it too. There's no room for evolution in a way. But I think this stops you getting better. It stops you advancing as an electrician with all the new techniques coming out. You need to adapt. And you need to move with the times, even though... Colleges are not really teaching anything like that at the minute. In this podcast, I'm going to go into detail of three new methods that you should be using whilst working as an electrician. Toolbox talks for electricians, helping electricians reduce stress, gain back time, and earn more money. Welcome back to Toolbox Talks for Electricians. I'm your host, Ben Poulter, and I say electricians, but I do know there's a few plumbers that tune in too. <coughs> As everything in the world, it evolves, it gets different, things change. Things are changing quite rapidly at the moment, I think, as well. And I think the way that electricians, they work, they need to evolve and roll with the times. Just for example, the common ring main. The ring main circuit that we're taught to wire at college. Why do we wire that? Because basically that's what we're taught. We need a 2.5 to go all the way around. 2.5 cable can only carry basically 20, I think 23 amps. So yes, you can't have a radial circuit in a 2.5 cable. So we develop the ring and that can carry 32 amps. And that's the normal thing that we do to this day, even a lot of people. Well, to be honest with you, I did a one a little while ago at Ring Main, but that's because they had a Ring Main in the house already. But they still use them to this day. And the whole reason that that ring main was sort of designed back in 1946 when the Second World War ended to save the amount of copper that we were using to wire houses for electricity. And the whole reason that a ring main was designed to be used in a domestic premises or even in the industrial commercial premises because the copper was sort of thin on the ground back in, well, when the World War II ended in 1945. So that's why it was designed to help with the shortages shortages of copper. And then now, years later, in 2004, we're still using it because we're used to using it. That's what we're taught to use. And to be honest with you, it worked. But I think the new way of wiring a circuit, use a radial. Radial circuits are a lot more quicker. And I don't see the need for a ring main anymore. You can just get different size cables. If you need 32 amps on that circuit, use a 4 mil cable. But with a lot of properties these days, they use less power. You don't have these big, bulky heaters in the room where you need to have a ring main that will take so much juice. TVs, they take a lot less amps these days. Lighting circuits, lamps with maybe LED lights, they don't take 100 watts anymore. They're sort of 7 watts, and they're probably dimmed down anyway if they're a lamp. And have you noticed the fuse boards that we put in these days, a lot of people say, oh, I'm surprised that that fuse board is bigger than the one you're taking out. Well, yeah, it's got a lot more space. There's a lot more technology involved, like the old Wirelux boards you pull out. They're tiny little things. So that when you come along and put a big metal box in, they think, oh, I thought it would be smaller. No, interestingly enough, it's not smaller. It's bigger, but 10 times safer. And you're more than likely got twice as many circuits in there if you're rewiring the house. It's twice as many circuits than what you've had previously with the old wireless board. And this makes it a massive advantage because if there's a problem with one socket, it doesn't take them all out. So I think when you're wiring circuits in a house, you don't have to have one fuse for the sockets, one fuse for the lights, like a lot of properties used to have maybe. You separate it up a little bit more. Upstairs, downstairs, maybe living room if it's different on its own circuit. Because you've got the potential inside a board these days. You can get boards with like 24 ways. It depends how big the property is. But you can separate it up a lot more. So if there is a problem with the sockets in the kitchen and people worry, they ring you up saying, hang about, my freezer's going to go off and everything's going to defrost. It's a fine. It's fine. You can plug it in to the ones in the living room or the ones maybe on the landing or the ones maybe in the office in a separate area because they won't be off. 
And I've had it before where an electrician will say, yeah, but you need a 32 amp ring main in a kitchen. Why? Why can't you have a full mill radial in a kitchen? You don't need a 32 amp ring. I don't think they need it anymore. And a lot of people say as well, they say, yeah, with the ring main, if you lose a neutral on one socket, it'll bring it around for the other one. Well, then there's a problem with that circuit. And then eventually, if someone overloads that circuit, that neutral is going to be carrying more than 32 amps. So it's potentially dangerous. So that's a stupid argument, I think. If you're going to say, right, if it's broken, then you'll still get a neutral or a live from the other end because it's a ring main. Pointless argument. I don't know why you didn't say that. Because if that ring main's broken, it's faulty in the first place. And yes, it might help the DIYers out a little bit. Because you know for a fact, all they do is go into a socket where it's 32 amps and look at that and go, right, that's in a 2.5 cable. I'll use 2.5 cable to do the rest of these 12 sockets What I'm putting in my new extension. It doesn't work like that. You can't spur if I spur if I spur. It's dangerous. But if it's a radial circuit and they go in a four mil, I don't know whether the DIYs know about four mil. But yeah, if you do it in a four mil and it's on a 32, then you can spur up a spur up a spur as much as you want. Because working as an electrician, you must know that you've seen it in so many properties over here in the UK anyway, of people that come along, they just spur off of a socket, off of the ring main. This, this socket has three cables in there, so someone spurred off it, it's fine. But then later on, someone will come along and go, oh, yeah, it's only got one cable in. I can fit another one in there. So they fit another one in. But what do they put on it? They put the shed where they've built a man cave. And then disaster strikes. It all goes tits up one day when it catches fire. And if it's not something like that, it's where a property is full of JB boxes under the floor. You always know that when you see a JB box under the floor, this job's going to be a nightmare. And this brings me to the next one. On the 17th edition regulations, when I did my apprenticeship, we were taught to wire the live in, the live out, and then a switch wire drop down to the light. And a lot of houses, they're still wired like that. Why? Because that's how it was back in the day. This is how we used to wire lighting circuits and ceiling rows. Because that's how it was back in the day. We used to wire ceiling rows like that. That's how everyone was taught at college. But these days, how many properties have got a ceiling rose and a lampshade? Not many. They've all got these fancy light fittings they've maybe bought from Ikea where all they need is a live earth and neutral. They've not got a three-plate switch up there. There's no point. So a new method, which I recommend, which I have seen in a lot of new builds as well, but then also it is taught at college, is taking your live and neutral down to the switch and then your live and neutral up to the light fitting. So basically, that one cable is switched. I know there's a lot more cables in the switch, but it makes it a lot easier for testing, I think, as well, because it's at a sort of height where you can get your tester in, where it's wrapped around your neck. It's a lot easier. But you could also go that one step further, which I find these days that some of these light fittings, they want to be smart controlled. So you might want to put a smart device inside that, that, that light. Rather than putting it down at the switch, because if you ever tried putting a bleeding, um, a smart device in a switch box, especially if it's like one of the 16 mil back boxes, you can't get them in there. It's a no point. If it's not a dot and dab wall, there's no way you're going to get it in there. You can't smash it out because it might be one brick, one skin wall. It's just a nightmare. So if you take a live up to the light fitting, then you've got that live up there as well. You've got a switch live, a permanent live, a neutral. You've got everything up there. You can put your smart switch up in near that light fitting, where it's a lot more convenient. Because also, if you wire it in where you go from the fuse board to the live and neutral to the switch, then out of the switch, you go up to the lights. What's the best scenario for down lights? Just a live and neutral. I know for definite you can if you retrofit in maybe a property where they say, right, I want down lights. You've got to put a JB in the ceiling. You've got no choice. You've got to put a JB in there and you can switch your bar that way. But what if you don't have to put JBs in the ceiling? I hate putting JBs in. If I can get away with it, I won't. If I'm extending a ring main, I will try to pull that circuit out and wire it around. Basically, I don't need, I don't want to use a junction box if I don't have to. But when rewiring properties, I will always take the live and neutral down to the switch 
and just a three core up to the live. Yep, you might not use that live at the moment, but if you do a good job, I can guarantee you that customer is going to ring you up and go, hey, yes, we've bought this smart, smart light fitting and we'd like you to put it up, please. So then you've got to go there and think, right, I haven't got a permanent live. You have if you're wiring a three core. It's not that much more expensive. You're going to get a drummer three core any, anyway. And if you're wiring a house, the only thing you're going to use that for is the smoke detectors and the two-way switching. So you might as well use the rest of it for the switch drops. But whilst I'm on this note as well, another thing I want to see every electrician start doing is when you're terminating maybe a switch or a socket in any back box, separately sleeve the earths. It's a bleeding nightmare when you go to do a test on a property or you're fault finding and you've got to take the earth sleeving off and unwind all the cable. Oh, it, it, it's a 30 second job. Yes, I know. But it would 30 seconds on about 20 sockets. It's going to save me no end of time if everybody just starts sleeving them individually. My God, yes, it will cost you sort of 0.2p more because you're using a bit more sleeving. Come on, make a point. Use this sleeving up because soon we ain't going to be using it. And I'm going to be the one to say it. Probably everybody's thinking it. But I haven't said it because they get them out of a pickle every now and again. But I wish they would stop selling them bleeding brown Bakelite junction boxes. They're rubbish. Almost everyone you see is jam-packed and a complete mess. It's a fire hazard waiting to happen. Or you might find that someone's put a few switch cables in there. Oh, there's not enough terminals for the earth. That's all right. We'll terminate them outside and just twist them together with a drill or a pair of pliers. They just look like a complete bodge job. When there's so many better options these days with spring-loaded terminations that do not go loose over time. I can guarantee you that these brown Baker-like boxes, they are the cause of so many fires. Because people just think sometimes if they've got a live neutral earth in that Baker-like box... We'll pick up a live neutral and we'll put a new socket in. Hang about, we're changing that socket to an oven. Let's stick our oven. There's a socket there already. It's they're a, they're a nightmare. This is what people use them for. DIY guys sort of thing. They go, they're cheap, and they can put them in. There's much better solutions these days. Wagos. Wagos, I love them. There's alternative ones. There's ideal ones as well that you can use. But be careful because I've, I've been told that they've got different ratings to them ideal ones. Wagos have got like they're up to 16 amps and they've got another big one that goes up to sort of 30 amps or 40 amps but they've got different amperages so make sure that you get the right one for the job you're doing but they're spring loaded like they've got a little lever where you can disconnect them I just think they're fantastic I love a Wago and there's so many companies out there like Whisker and Quickwire that are producing junction boxes that fit the Wago Sometimes people aren't interested in bringing out their own little connectors as well, like like Wago have, because I think Wago have got a fantastic brand and they do the job. To be honest with you, I don't know an electrician that doesn't go in with a few Wagos in his pocket because we use them every day. So that would be a much better option than these bleeding brown Bakelite boxes. Scrap them, throw them in the bin, will you? But another scenario, how many times has the electrician been called up and the customer says, I've got no electric whatsoever. It's all gone off. And yeah, they're probably con quite concerned because maybe they've got their fridges or freezer on and they're full of food and they don't want them to defrost. Or worse still, what if they work from home and the Wi-Fi goes down? That's normally the kids saying the PlayStation's gone off, something like that. But yeah, if the Wi-Fi goes down, so it's desperate, they're like, please come and help. So yeah, it's good for electrician. You get a call out. But you've got to sometimes drop what you're doing and get round there only to find out that it's just a little light outside. It's got a bit of water in it. It's a dual RCD board that's took the RCD out. So it's not a massive problem after all. Some electricians, yeah, you might like it. You might go, yeah, because I'm rubbing your hands together, thinking, yep, I'm going to charge these guys 500 quid to find in that light because, uh, yep, they were desperate to get the electricity back on. I get it. Yeah, fine. You, you probably do do that, a lot of guys. But what if... We scrapped off this dual RCD board and we put in RCBO boards. What's a dual RCD board? 120 quid. You can get a fully loaded RCBO board for around 200 quid with an SBD. And then that way, when you put them in, you're future proofing the house, maybe doing a better job in a way, being a better electrician. That RCBO board will make every single circuit individually protected. 
a lot better. So if anything goes wrong, like a light, it's got a little bit of water in outside. It happens all the time. Like little, if someone gets a dodgy light, puts it up himself, they don't do it properly. They don't seal it properly. It gets a bit of uh, condensation or something in there. It trips the RCD because they're so sensitive. But on a dual RCD board, that is going to knock the half of it off. And yet the customer's going to get upset. But what if it is an RTBO? It's going to knock that one circuit off. The light's going to be off. The customers are going to be a lot more relaxed. And it'll save them a bit of money because they won't have to go, it's a call out, man. My lad needs his PlayStation on. Because when someone's upgrading their board or you're putting a board in, it's going to be around at least 500 quid, let's be honest. So if you put, you've got the money there to put an RCBO board in, just do the best job you can. And if you're thinking about hang about, I've underpriced myself a bit now. Have a word with a customer. It is an easy sales pitch to a customer to say, look, spend a little bit more, get an RCBO board, get a surge protection. It's going to future proof your house. And to be honest with you, it'll probably make it worth more money. There's a lot of electricians out there that are maybe new to the trade that have learned at college how to work on a dual RCD board and maybe not really installed many RCBOs. Well, I can guarantee you that RCBOs are a lot easier to install than the dual RCDs. You don't get the nuisance tripping as much sort of thing. So if you're looking to think hang about how do I install these RCBO boards, go check out my YouTube channel where it's got a video on there of me installing RCBOs. And trust me, they are a lot more simple than a dual RCD board. They're, they're going to phase out sooner or later, let's be honest. But I do understand that electricians, they get taught at college and think, right, I have got to do it exactly how that tutor said at college. There's no other way I can do it. I've got to do it by the book. Napit said, not really. Part of being an electrician is being able to adapt, being able to adapt to new environments. Sometimes you get certain equipment that you think, yes, this is in the book. It should be fitted here. It should be perfect. Use your nugget, mate. Like sometimes do not use some equipment. You've got to use a bit of, common sense sometimes as well i've seen installations new builds especially where they put sockets and switches in some random place you're like ask people gonna walk in their house and wonder how to switch your light on because it's inside a cupboard like silly things like that you've got to be able to adapt as an electrician as well and think for yourself i think once you start to understand the logic of how electricity works and how it's switched maybe with two-way and three-way switches stuff like that it's quite interesting to learn then you do, you adapt sort of thing. You get better and better at your job and you start evolving. You get better at what you're doing. Let's be honest, we've got to evolve. Otherwise, we'd all be sitting in the van playing Snake on a 33 Nokia 10 rather than listening to this fantastic podcast. Because as much as you do need qualifications as an electrician, legally, you need to be qualified on paper to be an electrician. There's so much to learn out there doing the job. I agree. Yes, you do need to understand Ohm's law, V over I times R. Yep, I got that there. But yeah, you need to understand that and how it works. It's a great thing to do. They add, I haven't used it a lot in the past 10 years, say. I haven't had to do any calculations since we had Google on our phone. Sometimes you know, right, it's a 50 meter run and they want to put a socket in that shed. Yeah, you more likely know it's going to be a 6 mil armoured cable. But just to confirm, sometimes you think, yeah, I want to make sure because I might want to put a tumble dryer in there or something. So you do a little calculation on your phone. There's a calcula calculator on Google. It's simple to do, just to confirm. I've never really reached out to the book and said, right, what is it saying here? Google's in my pocket all the time. All you've got to do is look on social media at the amount of electricians that have adapted to a modern way of maybe promoting their business online and even showing people their work online. Because I've learned of so many social media influence sparkies, whatever they're called, like I've learned so many little, nice little tricks off of them. There's a lot of guys doing testing. You think that is a good way to test. Speeds up testing. I hate testing. It is boring. But if you can do it quicker, there's nice little tips out there. So all these little tips and tricks I try and learn. And basically, put on my social media for you to learn too. So make sure to follow the podcast and I'll keep you up to date with all the little tips and tricks that I, I learn from everyone else online. So until next time, I'll see you again.